The infamous composer of silence was one of the major musical philosophers of the 20th century. I'm the Classical Nerd, and today we're talking about John Cage. John Cage was born in Los Angeles in 1912. He showed musical aptitude as a young child and ended up graduating as valedictorian of his high school. He began to study theology in college, but he was a restless type who really didn't know what he wanted out of life. Eventually he decided he was going to become a writer, and since he figured that college wasn't really going to help a writer, he dropped out and did what every college dropout wants to do, hitchhike around Europe. So he did that for 18 months. Cage immersed himself in the European artistic culture of the time, and he returned to the United States with a new direction and new artistic pursuits that he wanted to explore. He still didn't quite know what he wanted to do until two years after he got back when he decided to focus on music as he had the most positive reactions to it. He studied first with tone cluster pioneer Henry Cowell, and then later with Arnold Schoenberg, who was at that time living, working, and teaching in Los Angeles. Cage sought out Schoenberg's tutelage, but Schoenberg realized Cage's musical limitations almost from the very beginning. Schoenberg, who literally wrote the textbook on harmony, thought that Cage had no sense of harmony. And he told Cage that if he had no sense of harmony, he would find himself running up against a wall. And Cage famously replied, then I will dedicate my life to banking my head against that wall. At around this time, Cage had a bizarre whirlwind romance with the Russian Laskin Xenia Kashevarov despite his numerous ongoing affairs with both men and women. The relationship eventually fizzled out and they divorced in 1945. Cage's early work shows a fascination with rhythm and timbre. In total, his music was never really based around harmony, and his more conventional music is all the more interesting for it. One of his great early achievements were the sonatas and interludes written for something that Cage invented called the prepared piano. What Cage did was he would stick random household objects in and around the strings in order to alter the tone of the piano. It takes hours to prepare sonatas and interludes, and piano technicians are not going to like the fact that you're messing with the carefully tuned balance of the strings, but when performed, they produce a whole range of sounds impossible to produce normally. The interest in more or less pure sound became of great importance to Cage. Throughout the rest of his life, he began to be more and more interested in pushing the boundaries of what we would call music. Spurred on by dancer and choreographer Merce Cunningham, whose affair with Cage was a final nail in the coffin of his marriage to Xenia. Their collaborations led to the development of chance techniques, whereby Cage and Cunningham would use an ancient Chinese text called the I Ching, or the Book of Changes, to determine their next courses of action, both musically and in movement. In many cases, the music for the dance and the dance were derived entirely separately and were only put together in performance. His continuation of pushing the boundaries led him to gain credibility in leaps and bounds in the avant-garde scene, but it didn't really help him financially. In 1952, Cage wrote his infamous silent piece, 433. This piece represented the culmination, the very apotheosis of his artistic philosophy. Post-433, Cage's often dire financial situation rose to meet his fame as a composer, and he was just as sought after as a philosopher and a lecturer. Now, the background for 433 and why it's so interesting is a video for another time. The piece has definitively entered the public consciousness as the silent piece. Around the same time, Cage and his followers began to organize things called happenings. In broad terms, happenings were minimalist stage works without the stage, or even a script. It was like installation art with people. It was very weird to try to explain. Elements of indeterminacy and chance were as much a part of Cage's happenings as they were in his pieces. Cage was a wildly interesting fellow. Cage loved the life and the music of the French eccentric Eric Satie. He paid homage to him in his piece Cheap Imitation, where he used the I Ching in order to derive variations and alterations to Satie's piece Socrate. Socrate? Socrate? I mean, it looks like this, so I, I, don't, I don't know. I've literally never heard it pronounced. After Cheap Imitation, he began a series of pieces known as Number Pieces. He pushed indeterminacy to its very limits. His health began to fail him, despite the adoption of a macrobiotic diet on the advice of none other than Yoko Ono. Active until near the very end, Cage died in 1992. Cage was not really famous for his pieces in and of themselves, as much as he was famous for the musical philosophy that led to their development. Weird stories of his life abound from the time that he nearly poisoned himself and all of his friends by picking wild mushrooms and afterwards became a very sought-out expert on mushrooms, 
to his chess playing with Marcel Duchamp, who playing an amplified cactus. This is literally John Cage playing an amplified cactus. Everyone, you're welcome. It's just a majestic sight. Cage felt as if all music was sound, that all sound was music, that there was absolutely no difference between the two. And friends would often find him on street corners in New York, listening to the sounds of traffic and of people walking or by, as if it were a Beethoven symphony. I have nothing to say, and I am saying it, and that is poetry, Cage once said. Above all, he was guided by the principle of bringing new ideas and new concepts to the old craft of composition. I can't understand why people are frightened of new ideas, he once said. I'm frightened of the old ones.